Hey guys, this is chapter eight. Um, in this chapter, we cover a lot. I mean, a ridiculous amount of things. Uh, so we will get through it. I will try to explain it in general terms, uh, ways that make sense, hopefully. Um, you've also, of course, read your book uh, and done the little practice on that. So you should have a pretty good grasp of these disorders when we're finished. We're gonna cover three different categories here. We're gonna cover anxiety disorders, we're gonna cover obsessive compulsive disorders, and we're gonna cover trauma and stressor related disorders, okay? So talking about just anxiety disorders in general. Of all the disorder categories in the DSM, anxiety disorders are the most common of disorders. Okay, The essential feature of the anxiety disorder is the experience of a chronic and intense feeling of anxiety. Okay, Most of us have noticed, you know, feeling uncomfortable before, or we may say, you know, I feel a little anxious. If you have an anxiety disorder, take that and make it much, much more intense, as well as it then affecting your daily life, right? We always have that piece in there where it has to affect your daily life in some negative way. Okay, so we have two different words here, and one is anxiety and one is fear. So anxiety is a future-oriented response, which involves a sense of dread about what might happen to you in the future, okay? So again, anxiety is that, that dread of the future or what might happen in the future, okay? Fear is immediate, right? Fear is that innate alarm response to this dangerous or life-threatening situation. Okay, so fear is that immediate. Anxiety is fear over what might happen. Okay, I use the term fear, but you know what I mean. <laughs> All right, anxiety disorders, like I said, they're the most highly prevalent of all the psychological disorders, uh, with the exception of substance use disorders, but that in, you know, incorporates so many other things that we kind of don't really you know, include that. So anxiety disorders are the most highly prevalent. Anxiety disorders are of clinical concern when daily functioning becomes difficult. Do know this phrase, right? Anxiety disorders are of clinical concern when daily functioning becomes difficult. All right. So the first one we're gonna talk about here um, is usually seen in children. And actually, there's a couple that we're going to talk about that are usually seen in children. The first is separation anxiety disorder. Now, if you see a child or you have a child who has a meltdown when you leave, do not be alarmed after learning about this. That is, That can be very normal. Okay, That does not mean that your child has terrible attachment and that they have separation anxiety disorder. It's that they really like their mommy or daddy or Nana or whoever it is, and they don't want you to leave. Okay, so they have a meltdown in order to demonstrate that they just don't want you to leave, right? But the idea is that after you leave, assuming they are with someone who is also responsible and caring and loving, they should recover fairly quickly and then go about their time. A child with separation anxiety disorder doesn't recover, right? They just, it's, it's overwhelming. It's not just a meltdown. It's overwhelming anxiety around the thought of the parent leaving or caregiver leaving, um, of the, you know, the idea of them leaving and the idea that they are gone makes them worry, is this person going to come back? Is this person going to die while they're gone? Are they going to, something terrible going to happen? And the child doesn't recover quickly, okay? So this disorder is characterized by, like I said, intense, inappropriate anxiety concerning separation from home, caregivers, or someone who they're emotionally attached. 
it needs to last at least four weeks, right? So it's not just sometimes. It's, it's pretty consistent for at least four weeks. This is no longer limited to childhood cases, but really we identify it mostly in children. Epidemiologists estimate that about 5.3% of individuals experience this disorder at some point in life. That doesn't mean that they come and get help for it, but at some point in their life they feel that separation anxiety in a disordered way. Okay, so there's one diagnosis. Um, People who develop this disorder are great at greater risk of developing other anxiety disorders, um, depressive disorders or ADHD or possibly conduct disorder. Um, that one is not as common. So uh, just of note, again, with anxiety disorders in general, a lot of people have more than one anxiety disorder or anxiety disorders are often comorbid with other disorders. Um, some theories and treatment on separation anxiety disorder. Okay, A biopsychosocial model seems really quite appropriate for understanding this separation anxiety disorder. Okay, So we look at everything. We look at just genetically this child came out this way, right? Um, what has happened in this child's life? Did the parents um, did one of the parents just pass away? Um, is there a divorce? Is there been a time when a parent has not come back when they said they would? Um, is there some sort of other chaos going on in life? Um, sometimes there is, sometimes there's not with this disorder, right? So this is why we need to look at all of these factors. Results of twin studies suggest really strong genetic support, okay? Um, however, a recent study suggests that children with anxious parents learn to develop anxiety through modeling. So we're going to see this more common in parents who are anxious or parents who have issues separating from their child. All right. The next disorder that we're going to talk about is selective mutism. Mute, you can think about the word mute, and you know what that means, right? Um, so selective, meaning sometimes, in some situations, mutism. This is a disorder that really originates in childhood. It's one in which the individual consciously refuses to talk. So it's not that they are having difficulties with verbalizing. Right? They're not having um, difficulties with motor functioning of their mouth or um, having, they're not having issues with their brain uh, getting the words to their mouth, but they are choosing in an anxious way not to talk in certain situations. So you may see a child who talks all the time at home, but when they get to school, they do not. They do not talk at all. Okay. Children with this disorder are capable of using normal language, but they become almost completely silent under certain circumstances. We really, really believe that anxiety is at the root of selective mutism, given that children most typically show this behavior in school rather than at home. Okay, So what do we do with this? Right, You, you do not want to punish children children for doing this. That will not help their anxiety, right? Um, some parents get angry and frustrated and want to punish the child. I promise that won't help the situation long term. Okay, children with selective mutism seem to respond well to behavioral therapy. So one of these things is um, contingency management, right? Contingency management can also be called like token economies or things like that. And you know, when we look at these things, contingency management, shaping plus exposure therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy is going to include those other things. But really, what we want to do is, okay, the child doesn't talk in school. Okay, we can talk about, with the child, you know, cognitions about, you know, what are we afraid of, what kind of social anxiety-like things are happening. 
Um, what is the fear? What's the worst case scenario? And, and then kind of easing into things, right? So with the contingency management, if the child doesn't talk at all, we say, okay, each time your teacher calls your name and you say, here, you don't have to say anything else. You don't have to talk for the rest of the day. But if you say here, you will get a sticker, right? Or something, some sort of rewarding thing for that child. And we do that. And then we slowly say, okay, just with the teacher, let's talk about blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, and then we move on from there. Oh gosh, a long time ago, I saw a child with selective mutism. And it was really interesting because I could hear, I could hear him talk to his parents outside in the waiting room. I knew he didn't speak at school. And he came in and he he didn't speak, but he also he wore a blanket over him. And he always wanted to have a blanket over him. And that was fine with me because. He's in a therapy session. He's welcome to do what he feels is right. Okay. But we, you know, kind of moved a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And I would let him from under the blanket, lift it up and just tell his dad something who would then tell it to me. And we started just with that, with that kind of a trust building, right? Eventually he'd let down the blanket a little bit. Um, and then we did some other things, which is instead of having him come in every week, we started emailing, okay? Technology is fabulous for these things, right? So he would email me his thoughts, which were beautiful and amazing, and he was a great writer. And um, he would start to email me some of the other things that he would do and some of his artwork. Um, and then we agreed to talk on the phone for five minutes at a time, right? We would talk five minutes at a time. And eventually, you know, with coming in every once in a while under the blanket, moving out of the blanket, you know, eventually we got to the point where he was able to function and then we could implement these things in the classroom. So I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. It's really interesting to see the progression. It's one of those things that just makes you love your job. Um, but it takes some time. I'll tell you that. Okay, the next disorder. Okay, so we've done um, we've done separation anxiety disorder, we've done selective mutism, and now we're moving on to specific phobias. Okay, specific phobias we're going to see in children as well as adults. Now, a phobia in general is an irrational fear. Okay. It has to be an irrational fear associated with a particular object or situation. Okay. Now we all have things we kind of don't like, right? Like I don't, I don't really like cockroaches. They make me feel yucky. I don't like seeing them. I don't like dealing with them. However, if one is scaring my daughter, I have no problem going over and getting it and taking it outside or vacuuming it up, right? Because I don't have a phobia of it. I just really, really don't like it, okay? A phobia would be if a cockroach came into um, the kitchen and I freak out and I stand on top of the counter and I cry until somebody gets it and then I need to leave and next time I think about coming into the kitchen, I can't come into the kitchen because what if there's another one again and I just can't do it and you know what, somebody else is gonna have to cook for at least the next week, maybe the next month, I just can't, okay? So it is overwhelming, it gets in the way of daily life functioning, all right? So a specific phobia is an irrational and continuous fear of a particular object, a particular activity, or a particular situation. Now, let's talk about where phobias come from. Interestingly, things that people tend to be afraid of, heights is number one, heights is the most common. From there, people also tend to be afraid of the dark, snakes, dogs. Okay. Heights is number one, 
But other common things are going to be these things that if we think back, okay, let's let's do this in a um, going back in history kind of way, right? Where we say, okay, long time ago, let's talk about the cavemen or people that lived before us. Um, if they were very much afraid of snakes, of things that could bite and kill them, and of the dark, which is a scary time because things can come and bite and kill you, or of heights so you don't fall and die, these fears are very adaptable, right? If you didn't have these fears, you probably didn't live to pass on your genes. So interestingly, if we think about People having these fears are people who survived. These are people who passed on their genes. So therefore, it seems to make sense to us that we have these phobias. And these phobias are much more common than phobias of guns, electricity, things that are more current, more modern. People should be like children should be afraid of sticking their fingers in outlets. They should be afraid of, you know, a loaded gun sitting around, right? But they're not. But they are automatically afraid of, you know, scary things, uh, the dark heights, you know, things that can bite and kill them. So interestingly, if we think about this as a biological perspective, or evolutionary, which is usually what they say. It's usually called an evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theories are interesting because we look at them in a backwards way versus most of our theories we say, okay, here's what we think. Now let's see if this is what happens. With evolutionary theory, we do sort of backward science where we say, well, here's what we think. Uh, yep, that seems to make sense from the past. Anyway, evolutionarily, we should be predisposed to have some of these fears, okay? But now in our current world, these things get in the way of our normal functioning if it is a phobia that causes problems, okay? Categories of phobias are insects and animals, natural environment, blood injection injury, um, engaging in activities in particular situations, variety of miscellaneous stimuli, stimuli and heights, which is going to go in our natural environment category, but I put heights down there again because that's the most common. So things that we, we know. So when we look at phobias, we see that there seems to be um, some different activity going on in the brains of individuals that have this, and that is typically in the anterior, anterior, insular cortex. Um, I think there's a picture of that in, in, oh, is it in your book? Anyway, um, you can look that up if you want, but you do kind of want to know where that brain structure is. Um, but the anterior insular cortex, okay? The medication that is used most common is benzodiazepines. Some people just call these benzos, right? But benzodiazepines, that's the medication that is used most often to help with specific phobias. Having said that, and actually anxiety disorders in general, benzodiazepines are used. So most of the anxiety disorders, not the obsessive compulsive disorders, but the anxiety disorders, benzodiazepines are often prescribed. With specific phobias though, really this down here, um, behavior therapy seems to really work the best. Okay, we also, though, some other theories of specific phobias is that we are misinterpreting harmless stimuli, right? So like um, somebody that is afraid of, oh, what have I seen that's interesting? Um, you know, in like if you get a bottle of Tylenol or aspirin or whatever, and right inside there's that um, cotton. <laughs> um, I've had somebody that just like can't, can't do it and like can't be around it. And somebody else has to help them. It's just an absolute no. It is just a horrible, horrible thought of that touching that cotton that's in there. Um, 
that is a harmless stimuli, right? So we are misinterpreting harmless stimuli. Um, Interestingly, we have this implicit positive reinforcement, right? And that is, look, if I see a, a snake and I freak out, even if it's a garter snake and not one that's going to hurt me at all, I, I survive, right? And then I hear a story about another person who didn't run away from a snake and turns out it was poisonous and bit them and they died. So positive reinforcement for me, every single time I run away from snake, I don't die. Right? Um, and there's other ways to see this sort of positive reinforcement, but we'll move on from that. I want to talk about um, systematic desensitization. Sometimes it's also called counter conditioning. Flooding is also a desensitization, but it's not systematic. Okay, here's how this works. Our systematic desensitization would be someone comes in and tells me they are afraid of, let's just stick with snakes because that's fun, right? So they are terrified, horrified, horrified of snakes. Like it freaks them out. Mm. So what we do is we teach them relaxation techniques. We teach them how to breathe, how to relax, how to feel okay and not anxious. And then we talk about snakes and we relax and then we talk about snakes, and then we breathe. And then at the next session, we bring out some pictures of snakes, and we breathe, and we look at pictures of snakes, and we relax, you know, because these things would create that anxiety response before. We're retraining. We are doing counter conditioning to train the person to not have that intense anxiety response, right? Um, and then we watch videos of snakes and we relax. And then we get a snake in a cage in the other room with the doors closed, but we know that it's in there and we relax. And then we bring it into the room and we relax. If we're actually talking about something that can technically be dangerous, like a snake, we're not actually going to pull it out of the cage and have to play with it, but we might. Um, if we're talking about something else, like somebody has, you know, some phobia of the color red, we're eventually going to, you know, make them wear a red shirt and breathe and be okay. Okay. Now flooding, I, I got to tell you, flooding also works. These are exposure therapies. Okay. So this is, both of these are, um, These are both exposure therapies, systematically and flooding. Flooding works just as well when it comes to research. However, most therapists won't do it because it's it seems mean. And that would be, um, so let's go back to the cockroaches thing. So instead of with systematic desensitization where we slowly feel a little bit better about it and we do it progressively. With flooding, I just put you in a room with like a hundred cockroaches and be like, sit there for an hour and get over it. Um, breathe. Like I said, it also works. Um, but like I said, it also seems mean. Um, I have this, this, this is like my favorite. Um, I don't know why I've, I've been using this since like I started teaching a million years ago, but this far side cartoon just makes me giggle. And this says Professor Gallagher and his controversial technique of simultaneously confronting the fear of heights, snakes, and the dark, right? So this would be flooding <laughs> and really bad. Don't, don't ever do that. Um, but I don't know. It entertains me. So, Okay, going back. So these are the things that we use for specific phobias. And really with most anxiety disorders, we do exposure 
therapy and some sort of like systematic exposure. <sighs> okay, ready? Next disorder. Social anxiety disorder. Social anxiety disorder is characterized by an intense fear of anxiety or social situations in which the individual may be scrutinized by others. The anxiety the person experienced is centered on a desire to avoid humiliation or embarrassment, okay? Social anxiety disorder does occur in children, but you really see it start to manifest in adolescence and older. An interesting thing that happens with adolescents is that they, they start to have something called the spotlight effect. This is a social psychology term. So the spotlight effect is where um, all of a sudden they feel like everybody is looking at them and thinking about them and thinking about what they're wearing and thinking about what they're thinking about what they're wearing and totally notices the one zip that they have and nobody else in class is paying attention to the teacher. They're just staring at their zip, right? Which is ridiculous. Everybody's just concerned about their own zits. But if we think about that and we think about it expanding and expanding from there, you have this intense social anxiety disorder. Often this manifests in people do not want to stand in front of, front of others and give speeches. Now, again, a lot of people don't like that, but there's a difference between I don't like that and I think I'm going to have a full-blown freak out, panic-like attack if I even think about standing in front of the class, okay? People that experience social anxiety disorder start becoming less and less a part of society if they don't get help, okay? And it becomes more and more difficult to leave your house. Now, theories and treatment. So unlike some of the other anxiety disorders, for social anxiety disorder, people are often prescribed SSRIs and SNRIs. If you remember, that's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and selective serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Some things that we do are motivational interviewing, acceptance and commitment therapy, and mindfulness and meditation. Some of these things, if you're not familiar with uh, motivational interviewing, a lot of what we do is we talk about changing and does the person want to change? And my job is not to tell them to change, but my job is to get them to come to their own decision to want to change. Okay, often we will say, you know, Let's make a pros and cons list. What are the pros of changing? What are the cons of changing? What are the pros of staying exactly how you are? What are the cons of staying exactly how you are? Okay, this is what you've been doing. How's that working for you? You know, if it's working, like, let's not do anything different. And the person's like, it's not working. I need to do something different, um, which is always fun. Acceptance and commitment therapy often um, includes what we call radical acceptance. And that is just, yeah, I feel this way. Yes, it's miserable. And here's what I'm going to do about it. Um, anything else I want to say about social anxiety disorder? I think that's generally it. But again, exposure, making sure that, you know, you continue going to school, you continue going to your job, even though you feel miserable doing it. Doing it and feeling miserable the misery lessens. Deciding to stay in your home and not leave tends to be worse. Okay, we're going to move on to panic disorder. Here we are, panic disorder. Panic disorder is an anxiety disorder in which an individual has panic attacks. Okay. Panic attacks on a recurrent basis or has a constant worry about the possibility of reoccurring attacks. Panic disorder is often associated with agoraphobia, but agoraphobia is a separate thing. So we'll talk about that. 
First, let's talk about panic disorder. So interestingly, a panic attack is this all of a sudden, what feels like out of nowhere, intense, 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 intense feeling like you're having a heart attack and you can't breathe and you are, uh, you know, feel like you're going to pass out and it's terrible, but it only lasts for a short period of time. It peaks and then it goes away. Some people talk about having a panic attacks, but they talk about feeling it for several hours or a day. It's not really a panic attack. That's anxiety, right? It's what we call panic-like symptoms. I think, interestingly, the panic attack is not actually the problem in panic disorder for people. Sometimes people only have one panic attack. The problem for people is the fear of having a panic attack, okay? So it is the intense and constant worry about possibly having another panic attack. And that is what causes so much stress and anxiety for the person. It's not the actual thing. It is this constant freaking out in their heads and worrying about like, oh my God, what if I have a panic attack in class and this, and I pass out and it's so embarrassing and everybody sees me and then what happens? What if I have a panic attack and it induces some sort of thing and I end up with you know, actually having a heart attack? What if I have a panic attack while I'm driving and I run into 500 people and everybody dies? Um, what if I have, you know, all of these things, right? This, this um, catastrophizing over what might happen if and when I have another panic attack. And so therefore people stop driving and they stop going to school and they stop going to the store and they stop doing these things because they're so worried about having another panic attack, even if they never do or will. I often challenge people in my office to have a panic attack. <laughs> um, I just look at them and say, well, have one then. Like, have a panic attack right now. Like, give it a try. Try to breathe differently. See what you can do. Most people cannot make themselves have a panic attack. I've never seen one be successful. I've seen people be a little bit frustrated that that's maybe probably not going to happen. Um, but, um, I don't know. I really enjoy anxiety disorders or I enjoy helping people work through anxiety disorders. So, um, people with panic disorder experience periods of intense physical discomfort known as panic attacks. Like I said, panic attack, a period of intense fear, physical discomfort, accompanied by the feeling that one is being overwhelmed and is about to lose control. This person experiences constant apprehension and worry about the possibility of recurring attacks. We talked about that. It occurs in 20% or more of adult samples. Um, so that doesn't necessarily mean the general population, but just samples that have been looked at. Okay. So then agoraphobia. So some people have panic disorder. Some people have agoraphobia. Some people have panic disorder with agoraphobia. Okay. So agoraphobia is intense anxiety triggered by real or anticipated exposure to situations in which they may be unable to get help if they become incapacitated. Okay, so again, it's there's not anything actually happening. So some people who have panic attacks start to have this agoraphobia where, again, they think, like, I can't go out. I don't want to do anything. I am basically frozen in my house because what if I'm at the store and I have a panic attack and I can't get out? Or what if I'm there and I feel like I'm going to have a panic attack, but I'm in line at the store and I can't just get out of line? And what if I don't know where the nearest exit is? And what if I have a panic attack before I get out? Some people have agoraphobia without panic attacks or without panic symptoms. And that is just simply like the fear of what if, right? What if I'm on the bus and I need to get off because I need to throw up? What if 
I am in the store and I start to have a, uh, you know, pan- uh, what if I started to have a panic attack, even though I've never had one, or what if I actually have a heart attack and I need something, or what if, um, all of these things, right? And so they start to not go out. So fear, anxiety of one of, or about two of the following five, using public transportation, being enclosed in a space, meaning like a theater, not a tiny space, being in an open space, such as a parking lot, being outside of the home alone, or standing in a line or being in a crowd. Their anxiety has to be out of proportion with the actual danger involved in the situation. Okay, so if you have fear of a situation that's actually dangerous, that's fine. But if your anxiety is significantly out of proportion to the actual danger, then we're going to call it agoraphobia. Okay, so things that have to do with panic disorder and agoraphobia. The neurotransmitters that we see do know this. Excessive norepinephrine and low GABA. If you don't remember these things, you can go back in your book or Google it, but really just know excessive norepinephrine, low GABA. Okay. Um, We have this anxiety sensitivity theory. Psychological perspectives, we have conditioned fear reactions. We're going to use relaxation training. And we're going to use a lot of psychoeducation. And that is, like I said, teaching people that you can kind of make yourself have a panic attack, but not really. Like, can you do it right now? Um, Talking about how a lot of people do feel this way. Talking about, you know, statistics and what's going to kind of happen. Again, we want people to get out. So relaxation training, exposure therapy to getting out, exposure therapy to these feelings Sometimes we will actually, so condition um, these things, or anti-sensitivity theory, um, sometimes you'll have somebody um, breathe into a paper bag, right? And we actually try to induce the feeling of a panic disorder and then them recovering from it. One kind of silly but technique that kind of works is spinning in a chair, right? So again, we're kind of trying to induce this feeling of being out of control or panic and we just spin somebody in a chair and then again the that feeling overcomes them and in a safe environment in the office they can start to breathe and become okay the thing is with people is when they're out if they have a little twinge of something or they start to feel a little bit lightheaded as to where most of us wouldn't notice it they're hyper aware of it and they hyper-focus in on it, and they start freaking out over it. So if we can induce these feelings, and they can notice that they can have these feelings, and it doesn't mean anything bad, and that they can recover from it, they're more likely to be successful out in normal, everyday life. All right. Our next anxiety disorder that we're going to go over here is generalized anxiety disorder. Now, generalized anxiety disorder is when anxiety is not associated with a particular object, a particular situation, or a particular event. So this person feels anxiety over everything all the time in all situations. Maybe not everything all the time in all situations, but most things most of the time in most situations. It's this constant feature of a day, a person's day-to-day existence. Now, we want to make sure that we know that generalized anxiety disorder is a big deal. It's not just a catch-all, right? If we don't know what to call it, we call it unspecified anxiety disorder. We don't call it generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder is this specific disorder where Many things cause anxiety that's intense and debilitating. If somebody has like anxiety, but it's 
not that big of a deal, but it's kind of a problem. We're going to code it, like I said, unspecified anxiety disorder. In the DSM-4, we had this NOS, or not otherwise specified category, and so you call it anxiety disorder NOS, not otherwise specified. In the DSM-5, we call it unspecified anxiety disorder. The code is the same. It's 300.00. You don't need to know the code. I just have weird things memorized. Okay. These are all of the anxiety disorders. Okay, so you do want to know all of the ones that we talked about. You do want to be able to differentiate between them. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about are obsessive compulsive related disorders. In the DSM 4, this obsessive compulsive disorder was included in the anxiety disorders. It has now been separated into its own category. With most anxiety disorders, benzodiazepines are prescribed. With obsessive compulsive related disorders, we see more of the SSRI, SSNRIs prescribed. We also see it have this, these different features. We also have a few disorders that have put, put, been put under obsessive compulsive related disorders. So our um, trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, um, hoarding disorder, and some things like that. They're repetitive. They're seemingly purposeful behavior performed in response to uncontrollable urges or ritualistic or stereotyped set of rules, okay? That these things are, are in here with these disorders. We have our obsessions and our compulsions. So it is a separate category. All right, now you need to know the difference between an obsession and a compulsion. I promise you'll need to know, right? So an obsession is a thought. Obsession is a persistent, it's intrusive idea or thought or impulse or image, right? Something that continues to come into your brain. The compulsion is the behavior. So the obsession is the thought. The compulsion is the behavior, that repetitive behavior, okay? So if my obsession is um, this pencil is dirty and every time I touch it it's dirty and it's contaminated and it's dirty and it's making me dirty and it's going to make me have um, get the flu the compulsion is going to be that I need to wash my hands right but I wash my hands and I wash my hands and I wash my hands and then I go to turn off the faucet and I turn off the faucet but then in my head I think that faucet is contaminated and I just touched it and now I need to wash my hands again and I need to wash my hands again People with obsessive compulsive disorder who do things like hand washing don't do it in a healthy way, right? So hand washing is a good thing. Let's please, please, after you go to the restroom or do anything um, that is yucky, wash your hands. If you have been in a public place, wash your hands. But you wash your hands once. Somebody with the disorder is going to wash their hands until their hands are so dried out and raw that they are bleeding. But they can't stop themselves from doing it even though it hurts. Even though their skin is cracked, they can't stop from doing it. There is this idea, this intrusive thought that tells them that if they do not perform the ritual, the compulsion, that something bad will happen. Now, the first disorder in this category is obsessive compulsive disorder. Recurrent obsessions that are inordinately time consuming or that cause significant distress or significant impairment. Four dimensions of obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessions associated with checking compulsions, need for symmetry and order, 
obsessions about cleanliness associated with washing compulsions. Um, and sometimes we have these hoarding related behaviors. Okay. Um, biological treatments. The most effective biological treatments are um, tricyclic antidepressants, but more common is going to be the SSRIs, like Prozac specifically is often prescribed. Psychological treatments. Okay, the cognitive behavioral perspective proposes that maladaptive thought patterns contribute to development and maintenance of OCD symptoms. Individuals with OCD may be primed to overreact to anxiety producing events in their environment. So we have behavioral methods that we use to treat OCD. We have exposure with ritual prevention. We do thought stopping and we do satiation therapy. I don't really do the last one very often, but when I do talk about thought stopping, I always talk about, you know, really visualizing that big red stop sign. Every time they have the thought, every time they have a thought, every time they have a thought, they think, stop, stop, stop. I know what this is. This is maladaptive. They may not use that word, but there's that. So exposure therapy is going to be the thing. So similar to systematic desensitization, we are going to do relaxation training. I often teach progressive muscle relaxation. So we teach relaxation training, we teach relaxation training, we teach relaxation training, and then we have them, you know, go wash their hands one time, turn off the faucet, come back into the office, they feel anxious, they want to go do it again, they so, so intensely want to go do it again, and instead we make them sit there and deal with their anxiety and try as hard as they can to, again, go through the relaxation. Sometimes, and typically we start with imaginal exposure versus what we call in vivo exposure. In vivo means actually doing it. Um, so we start with sort of imagining it, relaxing, and then actually doing it and relaxing. Um, had someone a long time ago whose issue, an obsessive compulsive issue, well, let's be clear, she had a lot of them. However, one of the particular things was writing checks. So before we had, you know, the ability to pay for all of our stuff online, we had to write checks. Okay. So that is, you would write, you know, your name and the number and you'd sign it and all this stuff. But she would get so obsessed with worrying that she hadn't done it right, that she hadn't filled it out right to pay her bill. And so she would write the check out and then she'd recheck it and she'd recheck it and she'd check it again. And then she'd put it in the envelope and she'd open the envelope and she'd put it in the envelope. She opened the envelope to check it again. And then she eventually, you know, would put a stamp on it and she'd walk out of the house and then she would um, go to put it in the mailbox, right? So she'd walk down the street and she'd go to put it in the mailbox on the corner and she, she kind of couldn't, right? So she'd want to check it again or she'd want to make sure that she had a stamp or she, she it, was, it was so anxiety provoking. And eventually she'd put it in the mailbox. Now, if you think about um, a mailbox around here, they mostly have these mailboxes at the post office, but in some cities we have them on the corners. And if you think about you open the little tiny door at the top and you put letters in. If you've ever been to a place where they have, it's pretty full and, and they're kind of letters popping out. She was so afraid of that. She was so afraid of like, what if she put it in wrong and it didn't get where it needed to go? Or what if the door got stuck on it? Or what if whatever? And so she would put it in there and she'd start to walk away and she'd have to come back. And she'd open the door and she'd check it and she'd close it and she'd start to walk away and she'd have to come back. She'd open the door and she'd close it. This was a successful businesswoman who couldn't make it to work on time because she was obsessing over whether or not her check was written properly and then if her check was in the mailbox appropriately. Okay. 
So we do exposure therapy. And that is, we talked about it. We did relaxation training. We had our breathe. We had her work through that. And then we would have her imagine writing the check, imagine putting it in the envelope, imagine putting it in the mailbox and walking away. The anxiety she would feel over just imagining it was, I mean, kind of upsetting to watch a little in some ways, right? However, seeing her get through it is a, is a really positive thing. Eventually, we got to the point where she had to... Um, we, we did a pretend check first, right? So we didn't do a real one. We did one she was going to send in the mail to her mother, right? And so it was just for practice. Her mom was on board. And she would call me from her house, which was just down the street from my office. And she would walk out and she walked to, you know, the mailbox and she would put it in and she'd have to walk away. And we knew exactly how long it would take her if she walked without going back. So she knew she was accountable and she would do it and get to the office and feel so awful and anxious, but we would breathe and we worked through it together. Fortunately, the um, postal system did not let us down and that fake check got to her mother and it was written properly and all went well, right? There's a risk in this um, if it didn't go well. But the idea was then, okay, she worried, nothing bad happened. Nothing bad had happened before. Actually, she had never written a check wrong ever. And we talked about what if she did? Well, they would call her and let her know, right? If they didn't get it, they would call her and let her know. Um, and so we went through things like this until she didn't need me anymore. And that's kind of the fun thing about this job is my job is to put myself out of a job, right? Um, she didn't need me anymore. She could write checks. Of course, we had other things that we worked on too. But I think working with OCD is really quite cool because you get to see a dramatic change as long as people are willing to put the work in. All right. Body dysmorphic disorder is placed in the obsessive compulsive disorders because body dysmorphic disorder is not an eating disorder. It is a disorder related with obsessions and compulsions. It's a disorder in which the individual is preoccupied with the idea that part of their body is ugly or defective. And I mean self-disgust over a part of their body. People with body dysmorphic disorder perform checking, um, or sorry, compulsive behaviors. Some of those compulsive behaviors are checking behaviors. So they may check themselves constantly. They may groom constantly. They may do this to an excessive degree. Um, they may constantly seek reassurance from others about how they look. Um, let me give you an example about a checking behavior. Okay. If you walk by a window and you look in it, a uh, glance, or if you walk by a mirror and you glance, interestingly, more people are going to immediately look at the part of themselves that they don't like very much, right? So if you don't like your thighs or you don't like your belly or you don't like your nose, often every time we look, we first look at that thing we don't like. That's ridiculous. We should not be doing that. But we typically do. So if you're somebody who does that, check in with yourself. Think about a part of you that you actually do like. Every time you walk by a thing and you find yourself looking, look at the thing you actually really like. Um, that is a checking behavior. Now, of course, somebody with this disorder does it obsessively. Another checking behavior is like, um, again, if you're somebody who feels uncomfortable with your belly, you may find yourself touching your belly, like with your arm or with your hand, like regularly throughout the day, which again is kind of a weird thing to do, but pretty common. Again, don't do that. Um, like, are you trying to make yourself feel bad? Yes, that's exactly what you're doing. But again, with this disorder, 
you would do it excessively and be unable to stop it. All right. Body dysmorphic disorder is frequently comorbid with major depressive disorder, social anxiety disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and eating disorders. That should pretty much make sense to you, right? These are just the, um, or this is a, a body dysmorphic disorder modification um, of the Yale Brown obsessive compulsive scale. So you can read these things and see, you know, how many of them. Um, apply to you or apply to the person that we'd be talking to. Okay. Treatments that are used for these things are typically SSRIs. Cognitive behavioral therapy is attempt to change negative thoughts about their appearance, as well as working on thought stopping, as well as working on um, resistance to checking behaviors and things like that. Um, sometimes some self-esteem training. Okay, let's do hoarding disorder, right? So hoarding disorder is well known because there's all these different shows out about it, right? Everybody thinks, you know, hoarding makes a great TV show. If you've ever seen one of these shows, if somebody truly has hoarding disorder, the idea of getting rid of stuff is horrifying. It is debilitating. It is so upsetting that they would rather live in a house full of trash than to have to let go of something. So it is a compulsion in which people have persistent difficulties discarding things. Even if those things have little to no value or a negative effect, they believe these items to have some sort of utility or to have aesthetic or sentimental value. But in reality, these items are often consist of things like old newspapers and bags and leftover food and, and things that really cause issues in the person's life. Okay, now there are varying degrees of hoarding. Hoarding disorder is when it is excessive and causing problems in the person's life. I saw once somebody talk about the difference between hoarding and collectors. Hoarders and collectors. And they said the main thing is that collectors are organized and hoarders are not. So if you can keep all of your trash, you know, and you can do it by putting it in shadow boxes and um, on shelves prominently displayed, then you are now a collector and no longer a hoarder. Hoarders usually, it's chaotic. Um, trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is hair pulling. So people will kind of start usually, usually just like messing with their hair. If you see somebody that, it's not that they twirl it from the bottom as much that they twirl it from right where the hair touches your head, right? right, where the root is, and they twirl it until they pull it out, and they twirl it until they pull it out, and it's it's like a habit, but it's a habit that they cannot stop doing. They can't, to the point where you'll have, uh, you know, somebody who does care about their appearance with a big bald spot who can't stop and will then continue to have a bald spot. <coughs> There's some anxiety related, but it seems to be more of this obsessive compulsive thing. A percentage of people that pull their hair out then put it in their mouths and, and either play with it with their tongue and then take it out or keep it in their mouths and like mess around with it and then swallow it. Some people end up with hairballs. Some people end up needing, like very rarely, but needing medical assistance because of their hairballs in their stomach. Um, so it can be a Big, big issue. There are people that specialize in just seeing people with trichotillomania. Um, there is some sort of relief or pleasure or gratification that ex is experienced by that pulling out of the hair. Uh, the prevalence is, you know, 0.6%.
Uh, it may be underreported because a lot of people don't tell other people that they have this issue. It's a habit. So reversal training is typically used. To be honest, this is one of these disorders where um, unless you specialize in it, therapists like myself, obviously we're doing some cognitive behavioral stuff and we talk about it, but we also do things like you have to wear mittens. You have to wear mittens. And when you feel, feel like you need to pull your hair out, you can't because you have mittens or you need to sit on your hands, right? Like these things seem ridiculous, but the idea is that you have to put something in place in order to not perform the ritual. The longer you don't perform the ritual, the less intense the desire to perform the ritual is. And of course, we're going to do relaxation training because we put that in with everything. Okay. This is really similar here, and this is the skin picking disorder. So similar to trichotillomania, we're just now talking about skin picking. Um, it's recurrent picking at one's own skin. It can be healthy skin or skin with mild irregularities. Um, when they're not picking their skin, they're thinking about picking their skin or trying to resist the urges. Prevalence here is about 1.4% of adults. Three quarters, interestingly, are female. I'm not really sure what that's about, but this is generally what we see. Okay, I want to say one more thing about obsessive compulsive disorder because sometimes people understand it and sometimes people don't. Okay, this example that I'm going to use is works if you're someone who cracks their knuckles. Okay, so if you're somebody who cracks your knuckles, I want you to not crack your knuckles. I want you to do not crack your knuckles, do not crack them now. Do not notice how your hands feel. Do not notice how your neck feels. Do not notice any of these things. Do not crack your knuckles. I want you to absolutely 100% don't touch your hands. Do not move your fingers in order to accidentally crack them. Now, what you should notice, and do not crack them yet, do not do it, but what you should notice is the longer I tell you not to do it, do not crack your knuckles, the more aware you come become of your knuckles, right, or of your neck, or of your back, or whatever it is that you tend to crack. I want you to, you know, at some point set a timer for three or five minutes where you say, I'm not going to do this. I am not going to. I'm going to resist the urge. As the more and more you try to resist it, the more and more you want to. And when I finally say, okay, you can crack your knuckles, oh, there's some sort of relief and people are like, oh my gosh, I need to like crack every single thing now, right? To like release that tension of when I wasn't able to do it. If you're not somebody that cracks your knuckles and you don't get that example, you may understand kind of what I mean. So think about something that works for you, something that you kind of do regularly and then resist it and don't do it. Whatever you do, don't do it. Okay. Some people will say like, do not think about the beach. Do not imagine the beach. Do not think about the sand. Do not picture the water. Do not picture the waves. Do not picture birds. Do not picture the warmth. Do not, do not think about the beach. I think some people do this with like a pink elephant. Do not think about a pink elephant. Don't, don't think about an elephant at all. Don't think about a pink one. And of course your brain does. It's very difficult to prevent yourself. So of course these things aren't causing us problems in life. So they're not obsessive compulsive disorders. Okay. Now, I told you this chapter just throws everything in here, right? The next thing we're going to talk about is trauma and stressor related disorders. Okay. The first one we're going to talk about is a childhood disorder. And that is something we call reactive attachment disorder. The disorder involves a severe disturbance in the ability to relate to others. 
but in an attachment type of way, not an autism type of way. The individual is unresponsive to people, apathetic, and prefers to be alone rather than interact with friends or family. Okay. These children emotionally are emotionally withdrawn. They're inhibited. They show low, uh, little positive affect, meaning smiling, laughing. Um, and they show little ability to control their emotions. When they are distressed, they do not seek comfort. These are usually children that have had some sort of trauma or, more specifically, neglect. So there is a learned helplessness component here where when they maybe needed help as a baby, needed help as a child, they were ignored or um, punished. And so this is how they turn. This can be treated with therapy and being consistently with people that actually do love them and are consistent um, but it is a sad thing. Kind of on the opposite side here is something called disinhibited social engagement disorder. And this can be kind of a dangerous disorder. The diagnosis is given to children who engage in culturally inappropriate or overly familiar with behavior with people who are relative strangers, right? So that is somebody that they don't know. They continuously just climb in anybody's lap and snuggle on them and are like intensely attached to somebody immediately and get upset of that person that they just met leaves. And again, this would be not just every once in a while, don't worry, but this would be a consistent pattern. Okay. Now these two disorders are placed in this category because they're found in children who have experienced a pattern of abuse a pattern of social neglect, repeated changes of primary caregivers, or rearing in institutions where high child-to-caregiver ratios. Okay, so children with this disorder are significantly impaired in their ability to interact with other children and with adults. And this is why we put them in the trauma and stressor-related disorders category. Okay, now we're going to talk about disorders that are related to trauma that we see in adults as well as children. Acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. You do need to know the difference, but both of them include the same things. I will tell you the difference in a minute. They both include a traumatic experience. To have something be a traumatic experience, it needs to be experiencing or witnessing something that put your life or the life of someone else in danger or that they were in significant harm's way, okay? So the traumatic experience is a disastrous or extremely painful event, has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental health. Okay, so acute stress disorder, and this is the difference. Acute stress disorder is what, we dis, is what we diagnose immediately after the event, and it lasts for up to one month. One month is on is traumatic, is PTSD. Okay, so acute stress disorder, this is a time thing. It is one day to one month. Symptoms would be intrusion of the distressing reminders of the event, dissociative symptoms, avoidance of stimuli that serve as reminders of the event and something we call hyperarousal. Hyperarousal is a, like an increased startle response where um, you're just generally feeling anxious. If somebody taps you on the shoulder, you jump. Um, you're kind of heightened aware of like, what is that? Who is that? Is somebody coming? You know, nervousness. Post-traumatic stress disorder, an individual experiences a experiences sorry several distressing symptoms for more than a month, more than a month following the traumatic event. The symptoms fall into these categories: 
of what we call intrusions, dissociation, and avoidance symptoms. Okay, so if you look in the DSM, there are clusters of these symptoms. Intrusion symptoms meaning like flashbacks, nightmares, things like that. Dissociation is numbness, um, abolition, remember this sort of um, um, like depressive symptoms. Um, avoidance would be if I was you know, attacked or raped in this particular alley. I don't go to that alley. I do not walk by it. I take a different route when I get go to and from work now, blah, 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 those kinds of things. Avoidance. Um, some theories here. A traumatic experience is an external event that impinges on the individual and therefore does not have biological causality, okay? Biologically, some people may be more predisposed than others to have a post-traumatic stress reaction after a traumatic event, but the traumatic event has to happen. So unlike most disorders in the DSM, this one is dependent on something that happened in your life. Okay, the traumatic experience is in part, um, in part leads to changes in the brain, okay, which then makes the person hypersensitive to possible danger in the future. Often people who experience post-traumatic stress disorder experience excessive self-blame. And this is what we see for people who end up with this disorder versus not among people who experienced the same traumatic event. So two people go to war, two people experience the same thing. The person that experiences excessive self-blame is more likely to then be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder later. Same thing with a rape event or, you know, um, any other kind of catastrophe. If two people experience the same thing, it's the excessive self-blame that is going to be there. Now, what do we do with this? We do see alterations in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that is affiliated with like the type of learning you do at school, right? I think the, the thing you're supposed to remember is you imagine a hippo on campus, right? So a hippo on campus is learning things that you would learn in school, and that's how you remember what the hippocampus does. Okay. <laughs> um, alterations in the hippocampus seem to happen for people. As a result, people with PTSD are then unable to distinguish relatively harmless situations like fireworks from ones in which real traumatic trauma occurred, like combat, and they freak out and lose it and dissociate, and it's miserable. This can be treated somewhat with SSRI, antidepressants, exposure therapy, and something actually called prolonged. So I'm going to write this down just so you guys know. Oh, it's not how you spell it. Okay, so exposure therapy, again, is used here. <sighs> Doing exposure therapy for somebody who's gone through a trauma is a bit traumatizing. It's really upsetting. The person, you see the person have a really, really hard time emotionally in your office. Prolonged exposure therapy is same. It seems to work well for people with PTSD. And this again is the person comes in and we talk about it and then we talk about it and you tell the story and you tell your story and you tell your story and you tell your story and we relax. And then eventually we have you, you know, kind of imagine it, go through it, which again is upsetting. But the thing is that you're having these intrusions anyway, not by choice throughout the day. These thoughts are intruding on your daily life. When we do this type of exposure therapy, it's difficult in the moment. However, 
that intensity of intrusions of these things in your regular life diminishes and often disappears. We take away the um, weight that it has. We take away its ability to really disrupt your life. Okay. Virtual reality therapy is used a lot for combat veterans at this point. It combines virtual exposure with relaxation and cognitive restructuring. Okay. Um, EMDR. Now, I do not do EMDR. There are people that do. If you are someone who has had a traumatic event and has gone to a therapist and you guys have done EMDR and it was helpful, wonderful. I am in no way taking away from that experience with what I'm about to say, okay? Eye movement desensitization reprocessing is a treatment that was created by someone. It is not taught in graduate schools because you have to pay to learn how to do it. Um, and all the research that's not done by the person that created it, all outside research shows that it does not work any better than just basic exposure therapy. Now, EMDR can work because it's exposure therapy. It's just exposure therapy combined with, um, some people that are speaking about it not very nicely might call it finger wagging. And that is basically that you just, you are taught to move your eyes in different ways while you're doing exposure therapy. Exposure therapy works. So therefore EMDR probably works. This extra gimmick doesn't seem to make it work any better than regular exposure therapy. I do think it is a gimmick. I do think it's a way for somebody to make extra money. Um, if something's not taught in graduate schools because you want to make money off it that badly, I, I personally have some ethical questions about that. And I think most people do. And that's why there is, there is, you know, a lot of issue with EMDR. Now, again, exposure therapy, excellent. EMDR includes exposure therapy. So I don't have a problem with therapists who choose to use it. It's just not research backed over exposure therapy. Okay. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, okay. So in the choices of discussion topics you did or do, depending on when you're watching this, have a choice of watching um, a video on PTSD. I did warn you in that, that it, it is can be upsetting. If you are somebody who is triggered by things that have happened to you in the past or that feels very upset by watching these kinds of things, don't watch it. You don't have to do that. There's no reason to put yourself in that situation. That's why I gave you lots of options. If you're somebody who would enjoy or wants to learn more about this, then do watch this video. Um, and there's lots of other things out there. You just kind of have to have to be careful for yourself what you watch and what you expose yourself to, what you feel okay with. If you start to feel not okay, you're allowed to turn it off. You prove nothing by continuing to push through it. Um, if you just find it interesting, then watch it. Okay. Um, that is it. We did a lot. I'll see you in the next chapter.